Previously, I bought a repossessed Mercedes E-Class at an auction for only $550, but it ended up having not one, but two holes in the engine block. Well, I purchased another one. This is a low mileage salvage title E320 with the same 3 liter V6 diesel engine. Despite having some body damage, the auction listing says it runs and drives. The other downside, it's 350 miles away in Philadelphia. With the cost of hiring a tow truck at around $2,000, I've decided to rent a U-Haul and pick it up myself. The U-Haul trailer cost a bit over $100 for a two-day rental. With the trailer hooked up, let's hit the road. Taking a little pit stop here. Aspen's being a good girl. And then over here, look at the snacks we have on this road trip. We got a couple things left over from our Western road trip and then some more trail mix, beef jerky and chocolate covered almonds. Yum. Well, we've arrived at the Best Western where we're stopping for the night and this is the trailer parking. And there's Aspen. We decided to stop and stay at a hotel overnight because well, it is cheap and it's a lot more pleasant to do this over two days than to try to do it all in one day. I am at Luciani's or maybe it's Luciani's and when you're in Philly, you gotta get the Philly cheesesteak that has steak, mushrooms, onions, cheese, and also a marinara sauce. I'm not sure if that's traditional, but it sure does look good. The next day. Breakfast was cranberry apple oatmeal and a cup of oolong tea. Fueling up. I calculated that we got about 15 and a half miles per gallon on the way down here, which is not too, too bad considering that we are towing a trailer. Now, I don't know how much the trailer weighs, but it's not exactly light. You can definitely feel it when we're going up some of the steeper hills on this trip. In any case, we have about a 10 minute drive to get to the auction yard right now, and then we can see what kind of condition this vehicle is in. Now, the reason why I drove so far to get this vehicle is because they're so rare in the United States. They're especially rare in the Northeast because all of the states surrounding New Hampshire actually banned the sale of these vehicles because of emissions requirements. Well, it is dirty. It obviously needs a new bumper and a new fender. Not a fan of the wheels myself. And then the window was open. I saw that it was open in the pictures, but I'm disappointed to see that it's still open. So rain and stuff, I'm sure, got in. But I guess it doesn't really look too bad in here. We're at a rest stop in New Jersey, and they really seem to care about what you do with your own vehicle around here. I'm currently passengering, but I was driving that first stint there, and I have to report that things are going pretty well. The truck is handling all that weight back there pretty well, and while you can feel it, it has plenty of power to go as fast as you reasonably would want to go on the highway, and everything is nice and stable. We're doing about 60 miles per hour for fuel economy, but we certainly could go faster than that if we want, but there's really no reason to burn all that extra fuel just to arrive at home a little bit faster. Come on so we stopped at the scales and look at that 12,840 pounds total that's actually quite a bit more than I expected it'll be interesting to see what the fuel economy is when we're that heavy also this front left tire here was really low I just pumped it up to 65 psi but I am so glad that I found it the last thing that I want right now is to have a blowout and end up on the side of the road waiting for U-Haul or someone to fix a tire here
All right, it is early the next morning. It is just starting to rain and it is gonna rain really hard and it's gonna stay raining hard for hours. And I have to get this trailer returned. So I have to unload this thing in the rain. Let's go. So this window did work. I was able to roll it up just fine. A little bit wet inside, but I'll deal with that later. Pop the hood. Still has the engine cover on it. I guess that's a good sign. It has oil in it. That's another good sign. Yeah, this vehicle has an inspection sticker that expires in June of next year. So that's a good sign, I guess. You know, this vehicle was driven when it was crashed and I don't think it was sitting for too, too long. Okay, so of the damage that I see here, the intercooler piping is intact. I don't see anything that's so wrong that's gonna keep me from trying to drive this thing off. The wheel is very turned and I think it is probably the tie rod end that's broken. Oh yeah. The tire right end is really bent there. And as you can see, the wheel over here is straight. So that's gonna make it a little trickier for me to get this thing off the trailer. Key is in the ignition and it's got some battery. Service E extended by eight days. That's not too bad. What do you guys think? Is it gonna start? Oh, it's turning over. Oh, look at that. It starts right up. Okay, sounds normal. Let's see if we can back off of this trailer. I keep getting some beeping over there. I'm wondering if that's like proximity sensors or something. Look at that, and we are off. All right, well, that makes me happy. We'll get this thing checked out tomorrow when it stops raining. And uh, yeah, for now, I gotta get this trailer returned. Tomorrow. It is a lovely sunny day. I'm just topping off the battery over here because it was pretty low. Look at that. That is a Mercedes branded battery. Not cheap. The date on it is 2015. Wow, I'm surprised that held the charge. It's very common for auction vehicles to have dead batteries because, I mean, who knows how long these are sitting in the auction yard. But that's why I was so surprised when it started yesterday and I was able to drive it off the trailer, especially with the date code being 2015. And that's a seven year old battery. That's pretty amazing. So I am faced with making the decision of whether or not I fix this vehicle up or I pull the engine out and install it in my blue vehicle. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about fuel economy and stuff, but first the cost of the trip ended up being a little over $500 and about half of that was the cost of fuel. Fuel economy, I said before that with the empty trailer, it got 15 and a half miles per gallon. When it was loaded with the car on the trailer, it got 14.9 miles per gallon, and the average for the whole trip was 15.2 miles per gallon, which is really not too bad when the vehicle weighed as much as it did. One of the factors is that tow haul mode was on for most of the time, and that keeps the RPMs of the engine up pretty high, and I think that if we had it off for most of the trip, we would have gotten even better fuel economy. Honestly, I'd rather just have a manual transmission and be able to control which gear I'm in myself. Okay, I am gonna try to use my Land Rover here to pull out the tie rod end and straighten out the wheels to make this a little bit easier to drive. Oops, I made it a lot worse. All right, so it looks pretty good to me, close enough so that if my welds hold, I should be able to drive it around at low speeds on my property. So which of these two vehicles do I keep? This one here obviously needs some bodywork, a new front bumper, a new fender, and the rear bumper is also in pretty rough shape. It also needs steering and suspension work. In fact, the tire is rubbing against the back here, so this whole thing was pushed back. And even after an alignment, I don't know for sure if it would align properly. So there's something to keep in mind. Another downside of this vehicle is that this only has the premium one package, whereas this has the premium two package that basically gives this thing bi-xenon headlights 
and keyless go in addition to a few other things but this vehicle also has an optional extra which is the 60 40 split folding rear seats which who would have thought that was actually an option but this vehicle has it and this one does not this one does have the parking sensors on the front and rear bumper, but who needs those on such a small car? This vehicle doesn't have it, and honestly, I don't mind. Talking about color, it's pretty subjective. I do like black vehicles myself. However, this shade of blue, it's pretty nice, and it's also pretty rare, so I think that is worth saving. As far as the interiors go, they both have the same color, so I can swap components from one to the other as necessary, and I think I have enough good parts between the two of them to end up with a pretty close to perfect interior. So it sounds like this one is the vehicle to keep, but of course, the engine is in this one, so I need to pull the engine out of this, and I might as well pull the transmission while I'm at it, because this vehicle has about 90,000 fewer miles on it than this one does, so why use a 200,000 mile transmission when I bet it's never had a fluid or filter change, and this one's gonna have a lot more life left on it. One hidden advantage of having the engine removed is that there's a common issue on these engines that thank you very much to you guys down in the comments for letting me know about this, but the oil cooler seals tend to leak on them and the job is quite a bit easier to do with the engine removed just because you can access like exhaust and turbo bolts and stuff like that a lot easier. Whereas when it's in the vehicle, it's definitely doable, but it's a bit more work. So let's get to work. Right, so now that I have this engine out, it's time to get in here and replace the oil cooler seals, which are located deep inside this V. And you can see how much of a puzzle it is to get all of this stuff out. But the good news is that I have really good access to the back of the engine for the turbo bolts, the exhaust bolts and whatnot. So that should make this quite a bit easier. And also I have the other engine over here on a stand so that I can refer to that if I need to in order to put this thing back together properly. Well, this is it. This is the oil water heat exchanger or an oil cooler to those of us who are human. And these are the seals that tend to leak. So I'll just replace those. So I got the engine back together and now I'm going to replace the belt tensioner and the idler pulleys. But before I do, I want to give you guys a warning about a serious mistake that people sometimes make. Now I ordered a kit that came with a new belt and new idler pulleys and a new tensioner and my plan was to replace these as preventative maintenance. I ordered the kit before I even had the engine out of the vehicle and before I checked to see if these were still good or if they need to be replaced. As it turns out, this pulley here is starting to go bad. You can hear the bearings quite a bit there. But this pulley over here is still good, and this one is also still good. Now, I have every reason to believe that these are all original. This engine has 110,000 miles on it, and it's not unreasonable for the quality components that they put on these engines from the factory would last that long, and only one of them is starting to go bad. Now, the mistake that people make is they figure, oh, while I'm in here, I'll just replace a bunch of stuff because I have easy access to it and it's easy to do now. That makes sense and I totally agree with that logic, but the part where it goes wrong is they go to the auto parts store, O'Reilly's or whatever, and they just buy whatever they have in stock, their cheapest component. And what you're getting is really cheap components made in China that have a really bad reputation for failing pretty soon, actually. This applies to pretty much all auto parts, but it especially applies to anything that has bearings in it, which these pulleys do. While I would say that you could probably expect a good 100,000 miles or more out of a set of OEM quality pulleys 
like this. The ones that you buy from the auto parts store are not going to last nearly as long. If you were to replace a tensioner like this that there's nothing wrong with, or a pulley like this one over here that there's also nothing wrong with, and you replace it with a cheap Chinese part, you're probably making your engine less reliable because, I mean, who knows how long these are going to last. They could have a lot of life left in them. But if you replace it with the cheap Chinese pulleys, they're probably going to fail a lot sooner. I think it's a great idea to do preventative maintenance like replacing belts and pulleys while you're in there and you have easy access, but just make sure you order quality parts, especially when it comes to components that have bearings in it, whether it's a pulley or a wheel bearing. The fuel filter that came off of it is a genuine Mercedes filter dated 2016, so it's good to see that it's been changed, but of course I am going to replace it. Well, I got the engine physically in place here. It really wasn't too bad to get it reinstalled. Ah, uh, look at that. The engine mount bolt holes lined up perfectly. As I'm reassembling this engine, I replaced these air filters and just look at how nasty those are. Talk about a lack of maintenance. These are the air filters that came out of the engine that was originally in this blue vehicle. After I got the engine hooked back up, it was time to add fluids. 5W40 motor oil, power steering fluid, and a 50-50 mix of coolant and distilled water. Before I can start the vehicle, I have to bleed the power steering system. And basically what that entails is turning the steering wheel from lock to lock a bunch of times. I think the manual says to do it 30 times, all while keeping an eye on the power steering fluid reservoir to make sure the fluid level doesn't get too low. The purpose of doing this is to get all the air out of the system. All right, well, let's see if I can start this up. I'll start by turning the ignition on. We can hear it's doing quite a bit of stuff. As far as I understand, I think the fuel system in this is self-priming. So by turning the ignition on, it kind of does its thing. I did have the left fuel rail and fuel injector lines off. So I don't really know if this thing's going to start right away. So let's find out. Ready? Well, the answer is no. Hey, there we go. Okay, so this is where we're at. The engine works great. It sounds good. It doesn't seem to have any leaks, so I'm pretty happy with how that's going. The transmission, however, doesn't work at all. And this is what I was worried about. So I think the transmission has a security feature built in and it basically detects that it's not in the correct vehicle and says, nope, I'm not working. The fix is not too difficult. What I need to do is swap the transmission control modules. The downside there is that the transmission control module is inside the transmission. So I gotta take it apart, pull it out, swap them, and then put it back together. Luckily I bought a transmission service kit with fluids and a filter and all that stuff. So it shouldn't be too much work. Let's go. I'm gonna start by draining the fluid out of this transmission pan. Ooh, excuse you. There's supposed to be a pickup tube in here that I'm supposed to push out of the way and that'll drain the rest of the fluid out. There it is. This is the transmission that originally came in the blue vehicle. And so I got this on an engine stand and now I'm gonna harvest the transmission control module from it. And on this side, that's the transmission control module, sweet. The next step is to remove the shift solenoids, making sure to keep them in order for reinstallation. There we go. So this is what I need to install in the new transmission. The date on the filter of the new transmission is 2016. That's excellent news because that means the transmission has been serviced recently. All right, so I got the old TCM installed in here. Everything else is from the new transmission. So new valve body, new everything else. Got a new filter too. Cleaned up the oil pan, new gasket. 
Well, my torque wrench doesn't go low enough for these bolts, so I'm basically just using it to make sure I don't exceed it and think I'm going to make it so that they feel tight enough. They're aluminum bolts, so I really don't want to snap these because I'm sure it doesn't take much torque. So I have a fluid pump here containing seven quarts of Liquimoly Top Tech 1600 ATF. This stuff is actually approved by Mercedes for this application, so I'm using the good stuff. So we've got a fill adapter here. Give that a little pump, and then I can open this ball valve. All right, the transmission's full, so I'm gonna start this thing up and we'll let the transmission get up to temperature. I'm also gonna go through the gears just to cycle fluid through the valve body. Let's see other. Oh yeah, look at that. <laughs> the transmission is working now, that's excellent. So transmission's at 56 degrees right now. I have to get it up to 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 degrees Celsius. Also, it looks like I have a little bit of an exhaust leak over here I need to address. All right, about 100 degrees. I'm gonna call that good enough because the fluid is actually gonna be warmer than the pan is. Oh yeah. Plenty of fluid coming out. I mean, that means it's filled way higher than it needs to be. I'm supposed to wait until the fluid starts trickling out. Uh, all right, I think there we go. So hopefully that's the right level and it's not that the transmission is just empty. Well, the engine is up to temperature and it sounds great. And underneath, I mean, there's nothing leaking. So I think we're in pretty good shape here. Before I bring this thing for a test drive, I bought a set of wheels and tires. I picked these things up for 500 bucks. It's got a fair amount of tread left and the wheels themselves look pretty decent. They're not perfect, but not bad. These are often E550, so they are period correct and they should look good on the vehicle. There's nothing really wrong with the current wheels. They're 16 inch wheels, nothing too special about them, but the tires are absolutely shot. And so this way I don't have to spend a thousand dollars on a new set of tires. <laughs> Okay, these wheels are stuck on there. There we go. I'm back inside because it's a little bit rainy out and I really want to address this headlight. It is yellow and clouded and it's really bothering me because the headlight on the other side looks like it's brand new. To address it, I picked up a 3M Ultra Headlight Restoration Kit. These are pretty darn good from what I hear, but I've never actually used one myself, so let's give it a try. The first step is to mask surrounding areas so they don't get damaged while sanding. Next, I'll use a drill and 500 grit sandpaper to remove the yellow, cloudy outer layer of the headlight. The headlight is left looking cloudy, but white instead of yellow. Then I changed over to 800 grit sandpaper to remove the coarse sanding marks. With the headlight smoother, but still cloudy, I'll switch to a 3000 grit abrasive. This time I'll be wet sanding. The headlight starts to look quite a bit clearer, but we're not done yet. The kit includes two clear coat wipes, which I'll apply for a shiny, protective coating. Well, what do you think? That's two coats of clear coat, and I think it came out fantastically. And because it has a clear coat on it, it should last a really long time before it gets yellowed again. Like, it should last years. I'll definitely be using that kit again the next time that I have a cloudy headlamp to repair, and I'll even put a link down in the description. 
It feels really good to have a low mileage engine and transmission fitted into this vehicle, and at only 110,000 miles, it's barely broken in. In fact, that's lower mileage than any of the vehicles that I own, the lowest of which is my Volkswagen Golf, which I purchased brand new, and now it has over 120,000 miles on it. Also, with the fluid and filter changes, this thing has probably hundreds of thousands of miles of life left in it, assuming that it continues to be properly maintained. So I was thinking about possibly doing some sort of a fuel economy challenge with this vehicle, like maybe seeing if I can make it to a certain city or something like that on a single tank of fuel. Sounds like that could be fun, but let me know what you guys think about that. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. I love how my enormous excavator is looming in the background, ready to crush these cars in case they act up.